Hey, welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about the fundamental theorem of algebra. We'll talk about its companion, the linear factorization theorem, also called the complex factorization theorem. And then we'll do an example, applying it and showing the consequences. The fundamental theorem of algebra is just that. It's fundamental or foundational to the work that we do with polynomials and rational functions especially, but you'll see its application throughout mathematics. It's almost innocuous, but when you see its companion, the linear factorization theorem, you can realize the consequences of this. Really importantly, what the found fundamental theorem of algebra is simply saying is that when you have a polynomial with degree of at least one, so one or bigger, so not a constant polynomial uh, or the zero polynomial, and with real coefficients, so you have real numbers as coefficients, you'll have at least one real or complex zero. So importantly, all this is saying, if you have a polynomial of a higher degree, let's say a degree five polynomial, what this theorem is saying is that that polynomial for sure will have at least one real or complex zero. Then when we marry that to the factor theorem, we know that if we have a zero, that the factor x minus that zero, so x minus c in that case, is a factor, meaning we can divide it out evenly and be left with that factor times another polynomial. Well, this statement holds for that new polynomial, saying, well, whatever you got left here, even after you pulled out that factor, that must have a zero as long as its degree is one or greater. So again, the linear factorization theorem here is just building off of this and the factor theorem. What this is saying, so if you have a polynomial with a degree of at least one and you have real coefficients, importantly here, I do want to note that actually we don't just have to have real coefficients. The fundamental theorem does also work for complex coefficients. So I'll just add that little note here. Though in the examples that we'll see, we're always dealing with real coefficients. So if you have that set up, degree big, one or bigger, larger, real or complex coefficients, this says you'll have exactly n real or complex zeros. So whether so you, we don't aren't saying about number of real zeros and complex zeros, but when you allow for complex zeros or roots of your polynomial, what we'll for sure have is exactly n of those. Importantly though, that's also when you're counting multiplicity. Meaning if we have a zero at x equals one of multiplicity two, right? Where that factor has that exponent of two right there, we would count that as two zeros. That's what this statement right here is saying. Or stated alternatively, if we have a function f that has degree one or greater, it has real coefficients or complex coefficients, and then we know the zeros are z1, z2, up to zk, and the m values here are their respective multiplicities, then what this is saying in combination with the fundamental theorem of algebra, the factor theorem, is that such a function can definitely be factored into linear factors. That's why we call this the linear factorization theorem. So where f of x equals some leading coefficient a times these factors of the zeros, so x minus z1, and I'm raising this to the m1 because m1 is the multiplicity of this um, and down the line here with the exact same form, just changing these subscripts right here all the way down to our last, which is zk and raised to the m sub k. And importantly, again, this is not a process, but what this theorem is, along with the fundamental theorem, is an existence theorem, saying these exist. In this case right here, we don't. this isn't telling us how to find them, but giving a function, given this context right here, we know the zeros and their multiplicities exist so that we can completely factor that polynomial. Again, importantly in this case is where we're allowing for complex zeros and real zeros. All right, then for an example, by the way, this example is actually something we could have seen before, but now we're dealing with these complex numbers that you'll see how they get involved here. But all we're going to do to find all the zeros of this polynomial that satisfies this condition is to use the rational root theorem, find a few zeros, factor out the factors associated with those zeros to a smaller polynomial, hopefully a quadratic, that we can then solve. The important consequence here of these theorems that we've talked about in this video is that when we found all the zeros, we're looking for n zeros. In this case, n is the degree of the polynomial, so we expect four zeros. 
Though importantly, this is only going to have four zeros if we take into consideration two things. One, we're considering real or complex, so not just real zeros, and we're also taking into account their multiplicities. So we'll start with the rational zero theorem here. And again, this will identify possible rational zeros for this polynomial. I'm looking at factors of 15 divided by factors of the lead coefficient of one here. Because this is a one, it's pretty nice. It ends up just being the factors of 15, which are so positive negative one, positive negative three, positive negative five, and positive negative 15. My job then is to test those, and we can test all of them. I tested them, and I'll just say kind of my strategy here is I'm going to look for enough rational zeros to reduce this down to a quadratic. So in this case, I need at least two rational zeros so I can get this down to a quadratic factor, and you'll see that in half a second. But I did a second ago, I calculated these, and I found that negative one is a zero of this function and three. And importantly, that means that the factors related to these zeros are factors of f of x. So for x minus one, that would be x plus one would be the associated factor. And we'd have x minus three. So importantly, these are factors of f of x, which then that implies that these, when I multiply them together, are a factor of f of x. And so that means that x squared minus 2x minus 3 is a factor of f of x. So again, so far what I found in looking for all of the zeros, I found two of the zeros. So I know I'm halfway there at least because I have exactly four zeros in terms of real and complex zeros. Through that work, I've also identified this as a factor. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, and I could do this, I could divide these out separately, finding their associated quotients of, um, of f of x, or, and I think this is a lot quicker, is take both of these, multiply them together, and divide this out of f of x. I'm now going to perform that long division right here. I'm going to do it fairly quickly. I won't give much commentary, but you'll see me work it out, and we'll talk about what we're going to do with that result. So here I've just divided our f of x function, which is x to the fourth minus 2x squared minus 16x minus 15. I've divided that by x squared minus 2x minus 3. Knowing it was a factor, I've confirmed that by getting 0 here. So this quadratic cleanly divides this. What this statement right here means is that this function right here, f of x, equals this x squared plus 2x plus 5, so the quotient times the divisor that we used right here, which we knew was a nice clean factor of this fourth degree polynomial. And again, what we currently have right here, we know this has zeros at x equals negative 1 and 3. That's how we built this based off those factors right here. 
Our job now is to find the zeros for this expression. And this was again while I was stating like if we have a fourth degree, I want to find at least two zeros. Because once we factor it out, now I can solve this. I'm going to use the quadratic formula right now. We can find these, these zeros, these two zeros, um, to fill out and find all the zeros for our original polynomial. So using the quadratic formula to find these zeros gives me negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 4, minus 4 times a times c, all over 2 times our a coefficient, which is 1. Then simplifying this, this discriminant inside the square root, we have negative 2 plus or minus 4 minus 20 right here. So this becomes the square root of negative 16 over 2. And this is pretty exciting. This is a situation where we're not going to have a complex uh, number because we have a negative under a square root. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to simplify this. I'm going to rewrite this as negative 1 times 16 so I can simplify this square root. Um, and we'll write this. I'll write this as 16 times negative 1 over 2. Importantly, in this case right here, we know that we can split this square root over these two factors. When I do that, I'll get negative 2 plus or minus. The square root of 16 is 4, and the square root of negative 1 is i. So this becomes 4 times i over 2. And then finally, I have a common factor of 2 between my numerators here and my denominator, so I can cancel that factor of 2 give me negative 1 plus or minus 2i. So we did it there. We found all of the zeros. In this case, again, what we did was starting with the rational root theorem, we found two rational zeros, negative 1 and positive 3. We used their associated factors to build this quadratic and then factored it out. We then had a quadratic times a quadratic, which we would expect to get a, a fourth degree polynomial right here. We know those zeros. We can find these with a quadratic formula. These ended up being complex zeros, but we have found all four zeros. So first of all, for this one, we just write these out. We have negative 1 plus 2i. That's one complex solution. The other one is negative 1 minus 2i. Importantly to this conversation, we knew that we were going to get these conjugate pairs. That was a statement we made when talking about complex numbers. And when you see the quadratic formula and where we get these complex solutions, it makes sense because of this plus and minus, right? That creates these conjugate pairs. But we have two complex and two real integer solutions. Final thing, just to tie this back into the linear factorization theorem that we talked about at the beginning of this video, what it stated was that this function, because of that, because it had real coefficients, had a degree one or larger, could be written in this linear factorization or the multiplication of linear factors, knowing we would have four of those factors for the four zeros when we include multiplicities in that conversation. Importantly, I just want to represent this, at this function f of x in that linearization. And I'll write the nice real ones first. So this is x plus 1 for x equals negative 1 factor, and then x minus 3 for the 0 at x equals 3. And then for these complex factors, I would write this as x minus, and then again I'm using parentheses for these complex numbers, of negative 1 plus 2i. So this is a complex 0 factor, and then the other one is exactly the same, except for it's, it's conjugate, so this is minus 2i here. And again, to make it very, very clear, this question that it was asking us did not ask us for this linear factorization, but it just ties so nicely with the stuff that we've talked about and finding these four zeros for this fourth degree polynomial.